to the uh, Ford Presidential Library. My name is Joel Westfall. It is my honor to serve here as the Deputy Director of both the Library and Museum, and to welcome you on behalf of the Archivist of the United States. We are also very pleased to have you with us for tonight's program. This evening's program is brought to you, as always, by the National Archives and Records Administration, with additional support from the Ford Presidential Foundation. We are all grateful to you who are members of Friends of Ford, who make events like this possible, such as exhibits, research travel grants, and other educational activities. Uh, before we get started, I have to do the obligatory, please silence your phones uh, and other electronic devices. Thank you very much. And so again, many of you know where I've come from in my career. Um, yesterday is, a, for me, a very important day. I served most of my time in the Department of Defense. Uh, I would ask, please, anybody here who is a veteran to please stand up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, prior to introducing our speaker for tonight, I'd like to provide you with some information about our upcoming programs and exhibits coming to both of our locations. Uh, here in Ann Arbor, we have a new exhibit coming in here for the holidays called Modern Quilts. Uh, and later this month, we will adorn the lobby with Modern Quilts for the Holidays. These quilts will include a mix of modern designs and traditional designs, and they will be on display through January 2020. Uh, opening early in December will be Extraordinary Circumstances, the presidency of Gerald R. Ford. This display will include photographs taken by Pulitzer Prize winning photographer David Hume Kennerly. Uh, Mr. Kennerly, as many of you know, is President Ford's personal photographer, and many of the images will include behind the scenes uh, uh, photographs, and he got amazing and remarkable access to the president when he was his uh, photographer. Over in Grand Rapids, and we hope that you can make the trip, but we understand this is Michigan and, and the driving can often be <laughs> treacherous. Uh, on Sunday, December 1st, Santa and his reindeer will be visiting the museum from 1 to 4 p.m. <laughs> Along with Santa, there will be holiday music and, of course, our, the former Brenton Train Village on display. This is a, that Brenton Train Village, this is a free event, by the way, on December 1st. On Thursday, December 12th, uh, at 7 p.m., Mary Evan Seeley's will share stories of Christmases, both pa past and present, at the White House. Uh, this event will mostly be li also be li live streamed, so please pay attention if you cannot make it across the state, uh, and pay attention to our website for information on when we'll be airing that on the, live, the actual live stream, or even the video that you can watch after. Um, also, again, as I mentioned, we will be hosting the former Breton Village train for the holiday season. The train opens to the public on December 1st and will be on exhibit through January 5th, 2020. This year, uh, for the first time, the museum will be free for the holidays uh, during Christmas break. So, our ki so kids can take advantage of the seeing the train um, and other exhibits as well. On exhibit, uh, one of my personal favorites upcoming, uh, on exhibit beginning in February 2020 um, at the museum, we will be having uh, an exhibit called The Continual Struggle. Uh, this exhibit is artist Brian Washington's ongoing body of artwork documenting the civil rights movement and America's historical struggle against segregation and other forms of race-based disenfranchisement. The continual struggle employs visual art as a means of storytelling, vivid recalling a time when people were willing to go to the streets to protest injustice and inequality. And again, pay attention to our website for more details on that upcoming exhibit. Handouts should also be available for many of these items outside. So. On to tonight's program. Now, our original plan was to have tonight's speaker here about 10 months ago, January. And I think you all kind of know what happened in January. We were all out of work. We were all shut down. So, sorry John, better late than never. Uh, John Carlin is here tonight to discuss his book, uh, Dawn of the Cold War, America's Battle Against Russia, China, and the Rising Global Cyber Threat. Mr. Carlin, as a career official, as well as a political appointee in his later part of his career, I believe, has served both Republican and Democratic administrations in senior management positions. Most recently, as the Assistant Attorney General for National Security, the DOJ's highest-ranking national security lawyer. 
Prior to assuming his role in NSD, Mr. Carlin served as Chief of Staff and Senior Counsel to Robert Mueller, former Director of the FBI, where he helped lead the FBI's evolution to meet the growing and changing national security threats, including cyber threats. Mr. Carlin also held positions as National Coordinator of the DOJ's Computer Hacking and Intellectual Property Program and as an Assistant United States Attorney for the District of Columbia, where he prosecuted cyber, cyber fraud and public corruption matters among others, trying more than 40 cases. Mr. Cowan now works in the private sector and currently works for Morrison and Forrester. There he chairs their global risk and crisis management team and advises industry leading organizations in sensitive cyber and other national security matters, white collar investigations and government enforcement actions. Mr. Cowan is also an inaugural fellow of Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs Homeland Security Project, focused on the unique challenges and choices around protecting the American homeland. He also chairs the Aspen Institute's Cybersecurity and Technology Policy Program, which provides a cross-disciplinary forum for industry, government, and media to address the rapidly developing landscape of digital threats and craft appropriate policy solutions. He has been featured or cited as a leading authority on cyber and economic espionage matters by numerous major media outlets, including New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, CNN, 60 Minutes, Meet the Press, Nightline, among many, many others. It is my great pleasure to welcome John Carlin, finally, <laughs> to the Ford Presidential Library. Thank you. Well, thank you for those uh, remarks and for the Ford uh, Foundation Library for having me out here. They said, uh, can't hear? Let's try. Is this better for in back? Mike not working. All right. Podium, I guess. Is this better? Yes. All right. Seems like the mic is off. It's probably the Russians. We'll be all right. <laughs> they told me I was uh, unfortunate not to be here in January because I heard it's warmer here in January. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me begin by imagining this. Imagine that you are in a company and you're running the company and someone from the information technology department comes and knocks and says, uh, we got a little bit of a problem. Someone has hacked inside of our system and we can see that they got into our computers and they stole a relatively small amount of personally identifiable information, some names and addresses, but don't worry about it. They weren't very good, we know how they got in, and we got them out of the system. So you don't think about it too much. Then a couple of weeks later, you get another knock on the door, and they say, boss, we got a little bit of an update. We got an email, it has some spelling mistakes and some grammatical errors, but they seem to be asking for two things. Number one, they want $500 in digital currency, $500 in Bitcoin, otherwise they're gonna release the fact, they're gonna make public that they got into our system and stole this information, and they're gonna release the information and embarrass us. Oh, and number two, they're mad that we caught them and threw them off the system, and so they want back on to the system. <laughs> Don't see that very often. So, most companies today faced with that situation are paying the 500 bucks, or they're deciding, who cares? Everyone's getting hacked. I'm not too worried about this. If they were such a good hacker, they wouldn't need our help to get back on the system. And if they make it public, it just won't be that big of an embarrassment. This is a real case though. And if that company had handled it on their own, what they would not have known was who was on the other end of that keyboard. And it wasn't the low level uh, criminal hacker that it looked like. He was a crook, don't get me wrong, but he was an extremist from Kosovo who had moved from Kosovo to Malaysia. He was a young guy, around 21 years old, his name was Farisi, and he moved to Malaysia in part to get better access to broadband so that he could keep hacking. With a fellow conspirator in Kosovo, the two of them hacked into this US-based trusted retailer that takes your information, that takes customer information and stores it. And they really did want the 500 bucks. But on the back end, Farisi in Malaysia had become friends with one of the most notorious terrorists in the world at the time. This is a man named Junaid Hussein. Junaid Hussein was a British citizen 
who had been arrested for computer hacking in England. He had served time and become radicalized while he was in prison. After getting out of prison, he moved to Raqqa, Syria, and was located at the very heart of the Islamic State of the Levant. At that time, I was running the National Security Division, and we were seeing a threat that we had never seen before inside the United States. We brought more international terrorism cases over a two-year period than we brought before. And what we were seeing that was causing this spike of terrorism cases inside the United States was a change in strategy by the Islamic State. The division I led, the National Security Division, was the first new litigating division in 50 years. It was the first new litigating division since the creation of the Civil Rights Division. And it was created as one of the post-September 11th reforms. And the idea was that our failure to share information within government, particularly between law enforcement and the intelligence community, had led to the unnecessary death of thousands of civilians. And it was a mistake we couldn't make again. And as part of a transformation that involved spending billions of dollars creating new departments and agencies, like the Department of Homeland Security, the Directorate of National Intelligence, and the National Security Division, that we were setting up new rules and insti institutions to make the sharing of that information as fast and seamless as possible within and between governments. And our strategy for prosecutors was that we no longer could view success as successfully arresting and prosecuting someone after the attack has occurred and families have lost loved ones and are grieving. That success had to be measured by preventing the attack from occurring in the first place. And that required a change in mindset and working with the intelligence community and others to figure out what the groups were plotting or planning and how to disrupt it. And we became very good as a government and working with partners at disrupting old Al-Qaeda, core Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda after September 11th wanted to commit another attack as spectacular and their method was to train and vet operatives, bring them to the Afghanistan and Pakistan region, meet them in person and deploy them in closely commanded uh, rings to try to do a spectacular attack. So they had tight command and control and they were complicated plots. And we became very good at picking up as they were in the operational planning phases and disrupting those attacks by using all the tools of government power. So criminal prosecutors, yes, but intelligence uh, community agencies, the Department of Defense, State Department working with allies. As we got better at disrupting that model though, the terrorists evolved. And just like Al Qaeda took advantage of Western technology and innovation, in this case aviation that's done so much good for the world and brought people together, they turned airplanes into weapons of destruction. We watched as the Islamic State, Terrorism 2.0, took advantage of another Western innovation, social media, the ability to communicate in real time across boundaries and reach people. And they started to exploit social media to try to turn human beings into weapons. And what they would do is they would target troubled kids and they would trouble other troubled members of the uh, community and they'd try to convince them by bombarding them day in and day out with messages sometimes broad scale uh, messages and then following up with direct messages. And at the time people would think of videos like the Islamic State put out a video that really was who they were that would show them burning someone alive or slowly beheading someone. And people would wonder, well, how does that work as a recruitment? Like, Who's looking at that and saying, I want to sign up for that? And the truth was they didn't use that to recruit. That's for people who had already believed in the ideology and they used that to put fear into their opponents. When they were recruiting, they actually were very sophisticated. They would micro-target certain demographics and we'd see things like in the United States, you get an ad uh, that they would push out. It would have the Islamic State branded in the corner. It would be soft focused lenses and it would show a handsome young terrorist handing out cotton candy to kids in the Levant. And they would say, come here, this is paradise when you live under the Islamic State. And when I say micro-targeted, I mean that's what we saw in the United States. But when I was meeting with my counterparts in the United Kingdom, they said, well, we're having a similar phenomenon in Europe, but here they're showing them handing out Nutella because Nutella is what the kids ha have in Europe. And the reason I go into so much uh, de detail, I'm not an advertising guy, but one of the things we did to get creative at disrupting this new type of threat, and it's the only time in my career we ever did anything uh, like this, 
is we brought in, actually, because we're not good at it in media, at figuring out how to reach young and troubled demographics, we brought in members of Madison Avenue advertising companies, internet companies, and nonprofit groups to look at what the Islamic State was doing and give us ideas as to how they're successful or not successful. And they're the ones who said, this is the same quality of advertising that they're producing, and they're able to do it now because we're providing them the technology and means for very, very low prices of what used to be difficult to produce as we've had this social media explosion. And we were seeing that impact in our cases. So we had open investigations in all 50 states. We brought over 100 international terrorism cases. And what we saw were two trends. One was the age of the defendants. In over 60% of the cases, the defendants were 25 or younger. And most troubling, in one third, one third of the international terrorism cases over that period, the defendants were 21 or younger. And that's simply never before been an issue uh, when it comes to terrorism inside the United States. In fact, federally, we very rarely prosecute juveniles. We had to issue new guidance to U.S. attorney's offices on how do you handle juveniles in the federal system. I tell you this because Junaid Hussein, the English-speaking British citizen who's moved from, and computer hacker, who moved from the London area to Raqqa, Syria, where he's located at the heart of the Islamic State, he was at the tip of the spear and one of the most su successful people at reaching what's the other part of that phenomenon. So one was age, 25 and 21 and under, and the other is in almost every single case we saw social media involvement where the Islamic State was reaching out to the defendants in the case and getting them to commit or attempt to commit the, uh, the acts inside the United States. Junaid Hussein was one of the most effective at recruiting. We saw him in the most serious cases. Junaid Hussein, while living in Raqqa, Syria, befriends Farizi, but they never met in the real world. So he befriended him entirely through social media, through Twitter, and started direct messaging him and convinced him to take that which he had stolen from this US-based corporation of customer information like yours, this personal identifiable information, he convinced him to give it to him in Raqqa. And consistent with who the Islamic State was then, this was a, a group that was using rape as a political tool, that was taking women and children into slavery, and that was killing Muslims and non-Muslims alike with impunity, he could care less about the 500 bucks. What Junaid Hussein wanted to do is what the Islamic State did, which was kill. And he curated this list of stolen information to create a kill list. And then using social media, he pushed the kill list back to the adherents inside the United States. He looked for people who looked like they might have federal addresses, dot mil, or might, uh, and might be police employees. And he said, kill these people by name, by address, where they live. That's the current state that of the terrorism and cyber threat that has caused the last four directors of the national intelligence community to say that the top threat facing our country is from cyber attacks, from nation states and from terrorist groups. And it was in the churn that's happening in Washington, D.C. right now, I think a, a part of the testimony of the acting director of national intelligence who was called up to testify about the subject of the impeachment hearing that got lost was in it, one Congress member said, hey, what are you most worried about for our country? And he said, as his predecessors had, cyber attacks. Now think about this case. If the private company had not worked with government, there'd be no way to address this terrorist plot. And because they did is why I could go to so much detail with you tonight and in the book. Because they shared information with us in government, we were able to take effective action. And using help from the State Department, we got the Malaysians to arrest Farizi, and he was extradited to the United States, to Virginia, pled guilty, and is serving 20 years in prison. Junaid Hussein was outside even the long reach of US law enforcement. He was killed in an openly acknowledged military strike by Central Command in the Raqqa, Syria, as were several of his closest adherents. And it was after, I can't say it's completely causal, but it was after those military strikes that we saw the decline in those cases inside the United States. Because as successful as we were in bringing the international terrorism cases as prosecutors, it was failure, strategic failure, 
as long as a group was succeeding at getting people 21 and younger to want to kill or join that uh, ideology of hate and violence. So we were able to take action, but it was complex. It's across, what is it, five, six different countries, multiple nationalities. It's the first case in the history of the department where we charged both computer fraud and abuse, so computer hacking, and material support to terrorism in the same case. And I call that threat the blended threat, and we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more. That trend of the criminal side of the House starting to blend with the national security and terrorism uh, side of the House is both where we are in the current threat and the trend I think that's going to continue over the next five years. But another part of the problem, if you think about it, is all those billions of dollars in those new departments and agencies that I was talking about that were created post 9-11, they don't fundamentally address the newest top threat to our country because they're focused on sharing information within and between governments. But to solve this newest problem that technology innovation has created requires sharing information at the speed and scale of cyber threats to the private sector and encouraging, incentivizing the private sector to share information back to the government at that same speed and scale. Otherwise, there's no way we can effectively counter the threat. And there uh, is one of the reasons I wrote the book I'm talking to you today. We're not where we need to be, and it's going to take a demand signal from us to keep moving in the right direction. And there are many reasons and good reasons why we're not where we need to be, but we need to make those changes now. So let me step back uh, a little bit. When I was first doing these cases, I was a computer hacking prosecutor, and I worked with a great squad in the FBI. And all we did was the criminal side of the house, and there's plenty to do, so it's not like we were looking for, for more work on the criminal side of the house. And I'd have an agent occasionally, and they'd switch squads, and they'd go from the criminal side of the house to the intelligence side of the house. And when they switched, they just disappeared. They went behind a locked, secure, compartmented door, and I didn't see them again. Didn't know what happened to them. In fact, when I went and was coordinating these cases nationally on the criminal side, I still did not know or have visibility into what was happening on that intelligence side of the house. It wasn't until I went over to work as chief of staff to the director of the FBI, who was relatively anonymous back then, and I think uh, Mr. Mueller would prefer it that way. I hope uh, to go back to that. But when I went over there for the first time, the door opened, and I was able to see what was happening on the intel on the national security side of the house with cyber. And one of the places I went was a facility where great work by the intelligence community to map in real time what nation states, particularly China, were doing to the United States day in and day out. And there was a giant jumbotron screen bigger than the wall behind me. And we could watch, and you'd watch Chinese actors from the military or intelligence hop into places like universities, and then hop from the universities into private companies. And then we literally would watch, they had a graphic user interface, so you could see it. You would watch data exfiltrate out of the United States. Billions and billions of dollars worth of intellectual property, trade secrets, trade negotiation strategies. It's what the prior head of the National Security Agency, Keith Alexander, called the largest transfer of wealth in human history. And so while it was an amazing feat and great work by the intelligence community to be able to watch it, it, it did not feel like success. <laughs> so when we were looking at it, we were thinking, well, what, what can we do to change so that we're no longer watching, but we're disrupting. And to understand why we were watching, you need to understand a little bit uh, that the mindset. And it was a mindset that grew for good reason in the counterintelligence and espionage community that grew out of the Cold War. And we still were seeing traditional Cold War type cases where just like the terrorism model eventually morphed, in the old espionage model, you'd have operatives inside the United States that it took great time, attention, and care by Russia in particular to run them. And you saw cases like a case we brought uh, while I was there that became the show The Americans, where there was, they were called illegals. Uh, they had Russian operatives living inside the United States, living American lives, and they were patient to leave them inside the United States for decades. And our approach was often to watch for decades. Because if you disrupted, then they would encourage them to try to find some other seam that you might not find. By watching them, you'd know exactly what they were collecting. You could feed 
false information back to them, and you could play the cat and mouse game that, that dominated Cold War espionage and counterintelligence, and, and, and continues. I want to say it stopped entirely. But what we were seeing now was something of an entirely different scale. And so, although we were able to do this feat of showing what China was collecting, we couldn't even keep up with what they were stealing. We could just give large estimates as to the amount. And their tradecraft was terrible. They didn't care if they got caught. So company, they were noisily hacking into companies. The companies would know that they were being hacked, you know, generally that it was emanating from China, and there was no deterrent to what they were collecting. And also, unlike traditional espionage, it was causing real harm to real companies and real families inside the United States now. And so when I went back to the Justice Department to leave the National Security Division, we started to restructure and reorganize. And we said, that, well, at a minimum, we need to do what we did with terrorism, which is to make sure that the prosecutors know the information on the intelligence side of the House. So there's no wall between the law enforcement and intelligence side. And you can look at the whole picture and see if you can come up with a way to disrupt. So we created a new network of national security cyber specialists in every U.S. Attorney's Office, so 94 U.S. Attorney's Offices across the country where they were trained on the one hand on bits and bytes in the Computer uh, Fraud and Abuse Act, and on the other hand, they were trained on how to handle classified information, how to protect it in a court proceeding. And the FBI issued an edict that said, thou shalt share with this new specially trained cadre. It's that change in approach that led to the first case of its kind. And this was the indictment of five members of the People's Liberation Army. It was a specialized unit, Unit 61398, and these members, as we showed in the criminal complaint uh, that we filed against them, they would do things like Westinghouse was about to do a joint venture with a Chinese partner. They were going to lease a lead pipe, no national security implications. And the night before they were going to lease the lead pipe, these uniformed members of the PLA went in and stole the technical design specifications for the pipe. And next day, no surprise, they did not, uh, they did not pay for the pipe. So it was about money. It was about commercial advantage. Or to use another uh, example from that same case, Solar Company, U.S. subsidiary of a German multinational, the Chinese uh, members of the military went in and stole the pricing information from the solar company. They used the pricing information to then price dump at the point that they knew would cause the most pain for Solar World. And after price dumping and forcing Solar World into bankruptcy, when Solar World sued for unfair trade practices to add insult to injury, they stole the whole litigation strategy. So they were stealing everything, and this wasn't traditional espionage. When I say they were stealing everything, they stole the formula, this is a case uh, against where the victim was Dow, they stole the formula for titanium dioxide, which sounds like it might be some military secret, but actually was the formula for the color white, including the color white that's used in Oreo cookies. And as much as I love Oreo cookies, that is not a traditional national security secret. They were stealing everything, even the color white. And so when people said, well, why are you bringing a case against a uniform nation of, an, uh, of another country? This is unprecedented, and China wasn't very happy about it. We showed things like an attachment that we included in the complaint that showed, hey, this activity started at 9 in the morning Beijing time. It went from 9 to noon. It decreased from noon to 1 lunch break. It then increased again from 1 to 6. It decreased overnight. It decreased on weekends, and it decreased on Chinese holidays. So the prosecutor in me would say, circumstantial evidence that this is coming from China. But also, think about it. This was, at the time, the second largest military in the world. And when they were putting on their uniform and going to work each day, their day job was not targeting another government. It was targeting private companies for the commercial gain of their competitors overseas. There is no way that a private sector company can keep up with the second largest military in the world. It is fundamentally a national security problem. And if we didn't take action, when it comes to this new world, President Obama called it cyber, in some respects, the Wild West. When it comes to this new world and you're trying to create what are the laws or norms, there's a concept that many of you are familiar with in, in your day-to-day -day lives of an easement. This is the idea that comes from British common law that says, if you let someone walk across your lawn long enough, they get the legal right under common law to walk across your lawn. That's the easement. And that's why people put up no trespass signs to show we're not okay with you walking across our lawn. In some respects, 
This case was a giant no trespass sign, get off our lawn, because international law is a law of customary law. And so precedent and how you treat it and what you accept becomes the norm, and then that ultimately becomes international law, and that's what sets the rules for things like the United Nations, whether or not we do sanctions, and how you do multilateral action. And we were trying to send a message with this case that said, and that's why we used examples, and there were plenty of them, unfortunately. It's one of the only, uh, they stole both from the steel sector from management and from the labor unions, because the labor unions have been attacking them for unfair uh, trade practices. So they did a good job of uniting management and labor inside the United States. You don't see that uh, very, very often, but both were equally outraged at what they had seen from, from, uh, from China. So we did, that, we did that case. China wasn't uh, particularly happened. And then fast forward a little bit. Any of you know what the first major attack was on US soil by a nation state? when it comes to cyber. Any guesses? It's from your book, is it the dam in New York? Ah, it's a good, uh, good guess. So it wasn't, uh, what, wasn't the first one uh, that, that came a little bit later, but the, the attack on Sony Motion Pictures is the one that ca uh, caught, uh, <laughs> caught most people's attention. And I'll say, we war games for years. What will it look like if a rogue nation state actor, particularly a nuclear armed nation state actor, tries to attack the United States. And we all thought it would be something like uh, a dam, the water, water supply or the electric grid. We never imagined it would be about a movie about a bunch of pot smokers, pot smoking journalists. How many have seen it? And it was a surreal experience in government. It's the only time the government have gone to brief the President of the United States in the Situation Room and have to start the summary as to why we're there with a plot summary of a movie. And, I don't know how many of you have seen that movie, but we had to watch the movie that caused the attack, the interview during our morning threat briefing with the Attorney General and the Director of the, uh, the, of the FBI. And I still blame North Korea for having to watch that movie over, uh, it was around Christmas, Christmas break. They had every right to make the movie. It's not my favorite movie. But uh, the question is, well, why are you treating that like a national security event? And actually, Sony's the one that people know. There was an attack prior to Sony, and it was similarly improbable. It actually was an attack on, it was Iranian actors like the Bowman Dam, but they had attacked the Sands Casino, so gaming. And the reason why was the head of the Sands Casino, Shelley Adelson, had said some provocative remarks about turning Iran into a nuclear dust cloud. And the Ayatollah was not happy and issued a fatwa calling for cyber jihad against Shelley Adelson. And shortly after, we saw a wave of destructive malware attacks. So the uh, bad guys overseas put malware, bad computer code, into the system at Sands Casino and essentially turned the computers into bricks. Now, there was someone quick thinking in the IT department who essentially pulled the plug to keep the malware from spreading all across the different casinos around the world. So it was relatively confined to the Connecticut area. But that attack did not get so much public attention. And I think it's instructive, and I wish we'd learned the lesson better at the time when it came to the North Korean attacks at Sony, as to why it is that Sony did so much more damage than a similar attack on SANS. So like the SANS attack, Sony, the North Koreans, who did not like the content of the movie, the interview, because it included an assassination plot on the leader of North Korea, they, they warned them, do not produce this movie. Sony distributed it anyway. And they unleashed their cyber attack. Like SANS, it turned computers into bricks. But that's not what caused the most harm to Sony, and it's not why people remember the attack. The second thing that happened with the, that attack is they stole intellectual property, like China uh, had in the earlier case. But that, too, had happened before, and it didn't generate, it didn't generate front page news headlines. The third thing they did in that attack, though, is what was most damaging to Sony and the brand. And what they did was the easiest thing to do from the perspective of a hacker. They hacked into the Sony system's email system, the least protected part of the system, and they stole salacious emails inside Sony from executives. They then used non-traditional media to push those emails out, and then they watched, ironically, as a dictator overseas tried to determine the content of movies inside the United States, they watched as the champions of the First Amendment, the mainstream media, published the stolen 
emails, and that is what did the most damage to Sony and the brand. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it is very similar to what Russia, who I think was watching and learning, did in, in leading up to our 2016 elections. When they went into the DNC, an unprotected part of the system, it wasn't, a, it wasn't the core voting infrastructure. They stole embarrassing emails. They used non-traditional media to watch mainstream media carry out the attack, of, in that case, of a country overseas determined to undermine our democracy. Just like in North Korea, it was a country overseas determined to attack the First Amendment. So with Sony, as we sat around that situation room table, one of the things we realized when it came to these na nation state attackers is that we didn't have the same processes and policies set up that we did with other threats. So when it came to terrorism or those who proliferate weapons of mass destruction, when you go around the table to each of the departments and agencies and they say, here's what I can do in response, we had tools like the ability to sanction, to cut off actors overseas from the use of the U.S. dollar and anything that touches the U.S. dollar, a powerful tool. But we didn't actually have that when it, come to, when it came to cyber actors. In fact, because it was North Korea and they had done so many other bad things, we were able to use existing executive order that was unique to North Korea and sanction them. And what you saw in that case is in 28 days, we were able to figure out who did it using that same approach that we had used for the first time with those Chinese actors of one, figure out who did it, two, make it public, and three, impose consequences. And while with the Chinese People's Liberation Army, the consequence came in the form of a criminal indictment, when it came to these North Korean actors, the consequence came in the form of additional sanctions. As we start moving into the next year, President Obama signed for the first time an executive order that allowed for the sanctioning not just of those who steal the information, like the PLA actors, but significantly would allow you to sanction the entities that benefit from the stolen information. So the companies that benefit from the, from the stolen information could be sanctioned for the first time. And President Trump has re-signed that same uh, executive order. As we're heading uh, towards this new approach, we find that there's a series of Iranian attacks. And Iran had attacked using what's called a distributed denial of service attack, the financial sector. Iran was mad about sanctions that were imposed at the time on Iran and wanted to get back at the financial sector. And so they did an attack where they take hundreds of thousands of compromised computers. So your computers at home, uh, many of which end up being part of what are called these botnets. So they're large armies of compromised computers where with a single command, someone overseas can get all of those computers to simultaneously fire code at a site, and they essentially overwhelm the site with requests for information by utilizing one of these botnets. And so, and there are ways to do that that are more sophisticated than others. Iran employed a botnet of these compromised computers to attack our financial sector. And like North Korea going after the email system, and like China had gone after the uh, email system of the solar company, we saw Iran hit not the core and most protected part of our financial system, but instead what they did is they hit the public-facing websites of about 47 different financial institutions, banks. It affected hundreds of thousands of consumers who couldn't access their bank accounts online and cost the bank tens of millions of dollars. We started investigating it. In the early stages, we still were in our default of we knew who was doing it, but we weren't sharing or telling the banks what we knew. And as it evolved and they complained, we got better, I think, at coming up with mechanisms so we could share, for instance, hey, we know we're about to hit a bump in the negotiations with Iran, so we think it's likely that these distributed denial of service attacks are gonna gear up, and that would allow them to purchase extra broadband, so there are ways to get extra server space so you can, even if someone tries to pile on these attacks of multiple requests for information, your website can still stay up. And as we were doing that, we investigated to see that we could figure out who by name and by face was behind the keyboard doing, doing the attack. And that investigation led to realizing that those same Iranian actors were not just attacking the financial sector, but they had hacked into the Bowman Dam in Rye, New York. And this is a relatively small dam, but they had accessed the sluice control systems of the dam, which means remotely they'd be able to open and close the dam and flood the surrounding area. Now, 
as it so happened, that dam was not working. It was down for physical maintenance. But I think you'll agree with me that our crumbling physical infrastructure should not be the front line of defense against, uh, against cyber uh, attackers. I was also always curious, why did they hit the Boma Dam? It's relatively small. I always had a theory that they, they're operating remotely and trying to figure out what to hit inside the United States. They took a target of opportunity, but there is actually a bigger Bowman Dam out west that would have been far more severe consequences. I think they hit the wrong Bowman, they hit the wrong Bowman Dam. But it was a sign and the first time we made public what we've been warning about abstractly, which is we are seeing nation state actors, Russia, China, not just Iran, inside our critical infrastructure with the ability to cause physical harm, to turn out the lights, to do things like cause flooding. You know, we'll get back to that a little bit more. And what we're seeing, at least when it comes to nation states, is they're not using that capability right now. They're saving it in a, in a case that there's a significant geopolitical conflict and it is now a new tool and a way to deter action by the United States because in response they can cause physical harm inside the nation. As we're bringing that case, we saw the largest theft of information that we had seen, which was China getting into the Office of Personnel Management and stealing the identities of almost every federal employee along with background check. In fact, my daughter's first piece of mail that she got, and she was delighted because it was addressed to her, the actual contents were telling her that her identity had been stolen. <laughs> so as we're heading into OPM, there's a major summit coming up between President Obama and President Xi. And here we did have a breakthrough that I think shows an approach of dedicated pressure and making this public can work, where right as we were about to head into that summit between President Obama and President Xi, there was a reporter actually in the Washington Post who had a leaked story that said we were about to use the new executive order that would allow us to sanction Chinese companies for Chinese companies that had stolen information and that we were going to use it on the eve of the summit. Right after the article, we got a phone call from China that said President Xi would like to send over his personal emissary uh, to discuss cyber-related uh, issues. And so they came over with a crew of, they way outnumbered us, there was about 40 or 50 of the Chinese delegation. And over a three day period, we're able to hammer out for the first time a norm. So setting the rules in this new wild west of what the law should be, where for the first time President Xi agreed, and then he got up on stage and said it, that one should not use your private intelligence, your private, uh, your, sorry, your public intelligence, your public military to target private companies for the private gain of their competitors overseas. And after that breakthrough, you saw the G20 adopt that same norm. So all the, all the major economies of the world. I was a little skeptical, I will confess, that they would live by such, such norm. But we did see a decrease in exactly that type of uh, activity, both in government and on the private sector. Many of the companies that, that handle helping other companies who are attacked, they all saw a decrease in the type of activity that was right inside that norm. Now, they were still doing things that we would consider a violation of that norm. So, for instance, they were attacking and stealing in bulk information from public health companies. So the Anthem breach, China related, hundreds of thousands, actually millions of records uh, containing health information. I think from their perspective, they would say, that's not for the benefit of a private company overseas. We're using that in the Chinese government, so that's fair game traditional intelligence. I also think with the current administration and the trade disputes that are occurring with China, that China is no longer seeing the benefit of the bargain that they reached and that some of the activity that had decreased is starting to increase again. It's no longer being conducted by the military arm, People's Liberation Arm. It seems now like it's being run by the, their intelligence services, the uh, MSS. So we've talked a little bit about there are four major threat actors when it comes to nation states that have been identified by uh, the intelligence community. China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia. We've talked about the first three in bringing actions. As we're heading towards the end of the uh, Obama administration, we had not yet brought a major action against Russia. And we were looking for actions to bring. And that's when you saw their activity trying to undermine the democratic elections. And actually, I told you about the new executive order that was signed by the president that allows sanctioning. The first time that executive order was used was too late, I think. It was after the election 
in December of 2016, and the first time it was used was against Russian actors. And if you look at who was in that sanctioned uh, order, what you'll see as well is it actually required, the first time we ever used the order, they had to amend the order. And I think this is significant when it comes to cyber, and the theme throughout these different cases is, we had focused our regime around things, you know, protecting our electric grid, protecting the water supply, and rightly so. But the major attacks we were seeing weren't on those things. It was on our values or key things of, uh, to our principles. So North Korea attack on Sony, an attack on the First Amendment. The Russian attack on our elections undermining democracy wasn't on a thing, but it was trying to undermine a free election. And so they changed the language of the ex uh, executive order. But as we think about threats to come, I think we need to be as creative, start being as creative as our adversaries in starting to, to think about what could be vulnerable and make sure that that's what we're protecting and that's where we're able to deter. Another individual on that sanctioned list was a man named Balan who had nothing to do with the elections. And when it comes to Russia, I think they more than any other country typify this threat that brings together the threat we see from nation states and terrorists with the criminal world. And what we're seeing now when it comes to criminals attacking companies is that the criminal world of hacking is big business. And so if you know where to, and it's very segmented as well. So there are some criminal organizations that are really good at coming up with the tools and the ways to hack, and others who are good at coming up with commercial uh, places where you can sell or rent those tools and then still other groups who are good at coming up with creative ways and monetizing those tools. And when I say there's a sophisticated back end, I mean literally if you know where to look on the dark web, that portion of the uh, internet that is not indexed, so it won't show up on a Google search, but if you know the IP address, you can access it, you will see a site that looks like Amazon, but it's Amazon for crooks. And when I say it looks like Amazon, I mean it has things like, uh, we have 100,000 credit cards that have been stolen, and you'll see reviews. And the review will say, I've bought from this guy before, and last time 10% of these turned out to be great. He's really good, you should buy from him, five stars. <laughs> and then you'll see another one, and these ones I always love, it'll say, one star, this crook can't be trusted. <laughs> like, well, what were you thinking? They, the, uh, so it, it's that sophisticated on the back end. And what we're seeing increasingly, and this goes to the blended, th uh, threat is, and this, will be, this is a, a real case that, that caused one of the sanctions, a guy named Balan, and he was an individual where when we were at the FBI, he was on our most wanted list. And we had gone to our Russian counterparts in law enforcement, just like we did on terrorism and child exploitation cases, to say, hey, you know, there's a lot of disagreements between countries, but there are areas that we agree are wrong, child predation, terrorists. This guy's just a crook. He did things like he took over the search engine for Yahoo. So if you searched, it redirected you to an erectile dysfunction site. And then he was taking a kickback as if he uh, had pushed you there and you legitimately, you know, he was, he was good at getting people who wanted to buy their, buy their services. So no national security implications, 100% was trying to make money. We asked for them to arrest him. And instead of arresting him, they signed him up as an intelligence asset. <laughs> Not what we were looking at. And the very group who was tasked with coordinating and being the partner to the FBI overseas was the group running him as an intelligence asset. So what they did was he did things like he was responsible for the largest theft of emails uh, and related information from Yahoo. So hundreds of thousands of email addresses were stolen. He was doing it because he had a spam scheme. So he wanted to just use all those emails to spam you, you know, with ads, make a buck. The Russians, however, intelligence officers were running him, and what they did is use that same trove of information to search for uh, information on the eve of their attack into Ukraine. So they could search for vulnerabilities. They searched for law enforcement agents to see if they could find embarrassing uh, emails that they could use to compromise or flip FBI agents. Increasingly, I think Russia is a kleptocracy. And so whether it's the criminals who are allowed to operate brazenly inside Russia. You can take photos of them. They have their monikers on their license plates with their tags that they use as hackers. They allow that to happen, but in return, they expect them to do the bidding of the state. On the other hand, you also have the actual intelligence officers, and because there's so much corruption there, 
who, uh, you know, their day job will be using their intelligence apparatus and tools on behalf of Russia, but then on the side, they're running criminal schemes with those same tools. So when we're trying to defend on this side, you can see the tool and the trademark, but you don't know whether it's a being run for purposes of Russian intelligence or whether it's being run for a crook or both. And that's the current state of, of the threat. So I've talked through a little bit how terrorists are using the internet, how uh, the main nation states are using the internet and organized criminal groups. And before I open it up to uh, questions, I want to talk a little bit about the trend line and what we're seeing. When you think about it, we've moved over a 25, 30 year period faster and further than any country in the world to take almost everything that we value from books and papers to bits and bytes to digital space, and then we've connected it through a protocol, the internet, that was never designed with security in mind. And in fact, there is no uh, secure system that's connected to the internet, no, and not in government, not in the private sector. A dedicated adversary, meaning a nation state, or these sophisticated criminal groups can get into any internet connected system with time. So there is no technical solution. We made that massive transformation without thinking through risk. And you, you get this sense when, both when I'm talking to government officials, but also when I talk to leaders in, in the private sector. They just moved without a full understanding of the risk. They would test to see whether it worked, but not whether it would work if there was a bad guy, a terrorist, a crook, a spy who didn't want it to work. That's where we are today, and we're playing catch up. And part of that's changing the mindset, so deciding whether or not it may not be a good idea to connect certain things to the internet once you, once you take into account what the risks are. Or, similarly, once you know that a dedicated can, adversary can get into your system, it's not a good idea to have a folder inside your system that's called crown jewels, right? Bad idea. <laughs> that said, it may not be a bad idea to keep the folder, just don't put the crown jewels in it. And so, you know, a cheap and easy way to d deter some of these adversaries is they don't know w what you keep where. So in your crown jewel or what looks like the most valuable information, put information that doesn't work. That's going to cost them time and money and ultimately will be no avail. And they're wasting the time inside the system and moving on somewhere else without ever getting what it is that would harm you the most. A version of this, once you realize what Russia did to us in the 2016 campaign, is what happened with President Macron in France. He looked and realized, Russia's going to target my campaign as well. They didn't want him to win. And sure enough, Russia did hack in and stole campaign-related in information. But what they did is they put some emails that were real and some emails that were fake, expecting it to get stolen. After it got stolen, the campaign told the media, hey, some of the stuff's not real and we're not going to tell you which is which. And it took the bite out of it and he won, he won the campaign. Cheap, easy, doesn't require great cyber, cyber expertise, but is thinking like the adversary does. We are right now behind when it comes to that threat. That's why you see so much uh, attention in terms of the threat from the, uh, how it's characterized as a threat from the intelligence community, but also why it's the top concern of general counsels, of boards of directors, of private companies. That said, we're not doing enough to address it. And now is a critical time. Because as much risk as we're facing from that transformation from analog to digital, we're on the cusp of another revolution. And this is the so-called Internet of Things. We're going to connect billions of new devices, refrigerators, toasters, things, objects. And there's good reason why they want to collect uh, this data. But right now, we're racing to connect those using an insecure protocol without default security. And we've already seen things like a pacemaker, an internet-connected pacemaker, put into somebody's heart. After it was in their heart, they realized that it wasn't encrypted the way it was transferring information. They never tested for that. So an 11-year-old with publicly available software could hack and kill. Then they went and rolled out a patch. And not to pick on uh, Microsoft, but I don't know how many of you have used Windows and had it lock up on you. And then you go and you get a patch and it gets updated. That's one thing when it's your computer, but it's another thing when it's your pacemaker. We can't afford to have the same type of catch up that we're playing now when it comes to computer, when it comes to pacemakers in our heart. Or to use another example, the cars on our road. You know, you think about the transformation that occurred moving from a horse and a buggy 
to a mechanized car. The transformation to our society of moving from a car with a driver, and this is just one sector in the Internet of Things, to a driverless car is also going to be enormous. And it could have huge productive value. I don't mean to say that it's all, uh, all bad. But we already had an instance where, and this was uh, Jeep Cherokees, 1.4 million cars were recalled from the road because an enterprising reporter showed, working with a hacker, that using the entertainment system, you could hack in through the entertainment system, then move laterally over to the braking and steering system and take control of the car. And so at the time in government, we didn't have a special regulation linking to the fact that cars are essentially now computers on wheels. So they used the existing regulatory authority that they had when it comes to safety defects, just like you had a brake defect or uh, a problem with the tires, that this was of such concern that it demanded a recall of the Jeeps. Now I think that industry is focused more on trying to build what I'll call security by design on the front end. That's the key. That's where we need demand from the public and new rules from our government to f encourage, incentivize companies to produce the devices safely in the first instance, to calculate, to price the risk in before they roll them out, whether it's the pacemakers in our hearts, the cars on our roads, or the drones in the skies. So thank you for being uh, here tonight to talk about these important issues, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I enjoyed your talk. Uh, while you were talking about the dam, I couldn't help but think of when I was a kid visiting the San Onofre nuclear power plant, and I was thinking, you know, back then in 1969, there was no internet, and it was safe, and. Uh, that sort of goes back to what you were saying about some things just shouldn't be online. Uh, our company has a lot of uh, machinery. I'm a manufacturing engineer, and uh, they can be controlled uh, through the Internet. So if something goes bad at 3 in the morning, an engineer that's 50 miles away can uh, fix it so the factory doesn't shut down. Uh, and we've been hacked with uh, before. The uh, question I have is, if China is doing this stuff, uh, why, uh, I guess the problem that I see is you could, uh, by not you, the United States could get tough with China saying, don't do this, they could try trade sanctions, but then there's so many companies that have businesses in China, uh, then they would get all their lobbyists to set up just to uh, get members of Congress to uh, stop that. So what solutions do you see to get China to not do what they're doing? Yeah. No, it's, it's a good and, and complicated question ultimately, but I, I think we showed that China, ultimately the theft of intellectual property, trade secrets, trade negotiation strategies is about dollars and cents. And so if we are able, working with like-minded countries throughout the world who agree with the principle or norm to raise the cost so that it outweighs the benefit of stealing the information, and instead it's better to spend those dollars on research and development, we could change behavior. I, and I think certain measures that have been taken recently are positive in, in that result. What I worry about a little bit in, in the current discussion is we've conflated the trade disagreements with the national security and criminal related uh, issues, and that makes it hard to change behavior because then there's a sense I think on the other side, if we don't know, we, we can't do the calculation, we're not sure what behavior we could change that would cause the United States to change its behavior and stop imposing sanctions or tariffs or designation of entities through the Commerce Department, which is another tool that's used, or criminal prosecution. So I think it's important that we have clarity in our action of here's what we're doing, Here's why we're doing it, and here's what you could do that, would, that will change our action in response to what we're seeing, seeing from you. That's one part of the strategy. 
Another part of the strategy, when it comes to core and critical infrastructure outside of the uh, deterrence, is going to be to make our system, we have to focus on making our system safer. Because if it's for a pure national security interest, I don't think we're going to be able to deter China, Russia, Iran from trying to gain access to things like nuclear systems, water, or electric dam. dam. We can deter their use of those uh, vulnerabilities, and you're seeing that now. That's why they're not being used. I think they're being saved, and it will take uh, an extraordinary crisis. But just their having access acts as a, a impediment on the U.S. ability to act, because you're afraid of what they might uh, do if they were to use the access that they have. And those are the more, those are countries that are deterrable. What I'm worried about in terms of protecting our vulnerabilities are groups like we started with, the terrorist groups, who have the intent, I mean, the head of Al-Qaeda in 2012 declared cyber jihad and cause for the maximum amount of destruction against Western systems, but they haven't had the capability to match the intent. And one thing we know about what they do in the physical world, if they get the capability, they're going to use it. They're not deterrable on it. So we're in a race against time, I think, to try to harden and prevent them from gaining that capability. And one thing I have not been able to figure out really is it's so easy to rent. I was telling you about those Amazon sites. It's not just stolen information. They'll also offer the services of things like botnets, you know, what the Iranians use to attack the uh, financial institutions. If a terrorist group got access to one of these cyber tools of mass destruction, what they would, be, what they would do would be far more, far more harmful. So I think we need to work to disrupt the markets where they're sold but also to try to make our system safer. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like you to expand just a little bit on your discussion of the bill that Senators Lieberman and Collins introduced, a bill that failed. And I, I just wonder, you know, it failed 40, 52, 46, you said. But I'm just curious, and if this is too much into the weeds, feel free to say mm -hmm. so. What were the hearings like? What, what was, you, you mentioned their, those senators' disappointment. Was the opposition based just on ignorance, not realizing the problem? Were there lobbyists involved? Or what, what caused that bill to be defeated? I see that as a turning point in terms of we could have been more effective sooner. Yeah, or to, to take it from there, maybe for, for the ones to, to the present day, um, through our Aspen group, we've been trying to focus on what are constructive solutions. Um, one area for, for legislation for years has been, and there's general agreement about this, right now each state has its own rules when you have a cyber breach. And so if you have a breach and it's occurred in multiple states, it, you have to figure out what 50 different states say the law is in terms of your disclosure obligations and what's protected. And for years, and you saw this in Europe, Europe has this general data privacy rule that's called GDPR that sets the regulations. There can be some differences to how it's enforced, but sets a bar for all of Europe. And in the United States, it would make a lot of sense to have a federal law that says, here's what you're supposed to protect, and here are the penalties if you don't protect it. President Bush, Obama, and Trump don't agree on a lot, but they all supported a, a federal law, and it has not it still has not passed. And talking with members of Congress, it doesn't look like it's likely to pass anytime soon, so we're gonna to continue to see the state's uh, experiment, which is good news for lawyers, because it creates a lot of uh, legal jobs, but not, not for our country. I, I don't, uh, not being, I, I think part of it is it's a sufficiently complicated issue that we're not able to send enough of a demand signal that this is unacceptable, and you need, you need to pass uh, legislation that provides information. It's one of the reasons I, I wrote the book is to try to make more concrete what we're seeing so that it rises up. I'm, I'm a little disappointed in our current presidential election as we head towards 2020. I haven't heard any candidate talk about it. It's just not one of the top uh, topics. It's not a question that gets asked in debates. And so there's no drive as you go into the executive branch. <laughs> on, the, on the why, I think privacy uh, groups and the companies that are affected and then depending on the industry have different views as to what that federal standard should be. But that's not really an excuse for not 
if there was enough demand signal, you pass something, not everyone would be happy with it, but it would be better than having 50 different versions of it, which is where we, we currently stand. So I think ultimately it's a, it's a question of each, working with each other, passing the message, sending the demand signal to representatives. And failing to do that, it's voting with pocketbooks and trying to influence behaviors of companies on how they protect, protect information with purchasing decisions. China um, got into Anthem for medical records. I understand the identity theft issue with that, but what in the world are they going to do with my medical record? <laughs> yeah. So in, it's important, I think, to look at some of those hacks, um, not in one sector, but start to combine the fact that, so we have now, we know China accessed a huge repository of federal data on employees in the, in the Office of Personnel Management hack. We know they, hurt, they hit the healthcare sector with hacks like the Anthem hack. According to public reporting, they hit hotels, um, Starwood, uh, and you know, it's been acquired by the Marriott. When you think about these vast bulk repositories of information, I think partly Number one, they can use it to search to do a, let's say they want to figure out someone they want to turn, not, not you, but they're going after a member of the military or the intelligence community or a politician. They can now search this vast repository um, and figure out, are they a government employee? When did they uh, start? Did they somehow disappear off the government roll? So it looks like they might be in the intelligence community. Do, what's their health situation? Are they vulnerable to exploitation on health? Where are they traveling and when, uh, when are they traveling and pull it together? So that's one concrete use that you could do now. I also think though, um, we're on the verge of some new technological breakthroughs. And one of which is, is often called artificial uh, intelligence or machine learning, where machine learning is essentially using computer algorithms to, to derive new information from vast repositories of information. And there are new breakthroughs on it every day, and the way to get better at it is to have vast bulks of data to play around with. I think they may be taking some of these vast bulks not knowing what insights that it may generate into the future, but thinking we're going to have it, we're continuing to have developments in AI, and now we're going to be sitting on this information where we can put this information, it's what feeds AI. It's not really the brilliance of your AI algorithm, it's the data that you have. And that may be the long-term play or, or consequence of it. There's one tool we haven't talked about as much today, we've talked about the criminal system more, but there's something called the Committee on Foreign Investment inside the United States that looks at foreign investment to see whether it might cause national security harm. And so, one massive change that used to be used more in the defense sector. So let's say a foreign co Russia tries to buy a company that supports a missile manufacturer. National security problem uh, and the sale would be blocked. Increasingly though, where data is the new fuel or weapon, they've changed CFIUS so that it focuses on things like personally identifiable information. And so you've seen some weird uh, CFIUS actions, public reporting, there's a, uh, there's a dating app a gay dating app called Grindr. And China tried to buy Grindr, a Chinese consortium, and you saw that the, uh, the newspaper said it was blocked or slowed down because it was being reviewed for national security concerns. The original acquisition of Starwood, there was a Chinese conglomerate, and that too, according to public reporting, was blocked by CFIUS, and they withdrew from, from the bidding. So I think what they're seeing now is there's an attempt to gain these vast um, uh, repositories of, of data. Sometimes it's through theft, but it could also be through acquisition. And so you're seeing that starting to be treated as a national security concern. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you say a little bit more about what the Russians did in the 2016 election? Like, who, which side were they supporting or they just didn't know? Or, uh, and, and how did they choose what candidate they liked? Thank you. Well, I'm going to say something that sounds familiar here, but there's a very good report on that. Uh, <laughs> the, the Mueller report, which I encourage you, encourage you to read, I think goes into some, into some detail, although not in the why. I will say, though, that just overarching whatever, any particular election or particular candidate that Russia supports, I think under Putin that 
Putin views democracy as an existential threat to his regime. And so you've seen similar anti-democratic um, techniques employed both through cyber-related espionage and human-related operations attacking democracies throughout the Western, the Western world. And he's going to continue, I think, to, to attack the concept that democracy can work or be an effective governance. And so we need to plan accordingly. Thank you. Fascinating talk. So my question really is, is trying to think about the cost to a, a country like China or Iran as to the size of this effort. Because I, I have an idea of sort of one room where there are guys sitting around tables with computers. Um, we have this huge military in the United States. Um, you know, it's huge, but if it's just a, you know, three guys sitting, I know it's not three guys, but a very small group of, of people sitting in some room able to do all this, that's different than requiring a vast resource. I mean, eventually it should mean that it's not just Iran, but it's Saudi Arabia doing this. It's, you know, virtually every country. So I that's think that's my question. Is yeah. Cost. No, I think that's exactly right. That, um, and it's kind of like the crowdsourcing of terrorism or terrorism 2.0, where the use of tools where you could produce very sophisticated propaganda, and you think about you know, thousands of years of military doctrine on trying to have instantaneous secret communications, and what an advantage that would be for a military, and we've provided that for free now to our adversaries across the world, right? As we've, as we've started to transmit this technology, it, we've increased what are called sometimes asymmetric threats. So the ability of someone with very little resources, size, without control of territory, to cause a threat to a powerful, uh, a powerful country. And it, they will continue to, right now, if you were to trend line over the next five years, I'm convinced, as is almost everyone who's in this field, that it's going to get worse before it gets better. So the tools are getting more sophisticated. They're getting much easier to access. We call them script kitties, or people that don't really know how to use the internet, rent one of these tools from one of these dark web, and all, you know, they're very easy. They come with good user instructions, and so all you're doing basically is hitting a click and you're launching a cyber, uh, cyber attack. We had one attack. Um, more sophisticated than that, but it was, it took down the internet uh, uh, towards the end of 2016. It was the Mirai botnet. And it was, and what it was is it was one of those um, botnets, so compromised computers, but they, this was someone who targeted Internet of Things devices, so things like your baby monitor, all these devices that are rolled out and they're not encrypted, so they're very, very easy to hack. And so it became much, much bigger than your usual botnet. And we thought maybe this was a nation state attack, it, uh, knocked down the backbone in Canada and the US, affected all these different companies, and turned out to be a kid in Canada who was mad at a rival gaming group and had created this tool that was so strong that when he was trying to attack the rival gaming group, it overwhelmed the ability of the internet to handle the traffic. So that's where I think we need to think, um, and one of the programs we're advocating through the Aspen Institute is like a cyber moonshot. I mean, the part of me, I'm sounding uh, somewhat, somewhat pessimistic uh, about the future, but in some ways I am optimistic about it because it, it is a question of will, ultimately. I mean, as much as um, you know, it seems today that one cannot humanly function without an iPhone, it's still a really recent uh, innovation. And so this is a problem we innovated our way into and we could innovate our way out of. But it does require accepting the principle that what we've built this whole foundation of and I went and interviewed you know, some of the original uh, creators and coders of, of the internet. They deliberately designed it without security in mind as a communication medium. If we keep using it for things that need to be uh, secure or linked to d devices, we're going to keep growing the problem that we have. You mentioned that the four major nation uh, states that are actors against the United States are uh, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Um, Research institutions such as University of Michigan and others in this country are training vast numbers of Chinese and other nationalities in the fields of computer science and engineering. To what extent are we training the next generation of hackers into our own companies and government? Yeah, it's an important, so 
I think you're seeing two things. So one, there's been an outreach. I think there was a lack of awareness, and in, in China in particular was um, exploiting the, the students that they sent, even if they didn't want to do it when they were over here. They had enormous leverage back in China against their families and otherwise, so to put enormous pressure on them to provide technological secrets or otherwise that they obtained here. And so at, at a minimum, I think there needed to be, and there's starting to be greater awareness in universities and other places that were being targeted that this is a threat and you need to think about it, and particularly when you're doing research that may later have, depending on the implications of the research, it's not classified now, but may be used for very important systems to protect it against that threat and for companies to think about the insider threat, which is not, and I saw uh, you know, numerous cases that we brought, it's, it would be uh, narrow-minded narrow and a bad insider threat if you did it just by ethnicity because it would be wrong. It's not where we're seeing the threats. There's all sorts of ways to compromise. So you need a program that protects the information against insiders. Your question's a little broader though, which is what type of limit should we place on training here for people that might go back? I think that's a hard question. You know, go back, one of the, when we're trying to figure out what to do with cyber, there are some, it's why I called it the code war, I think we're in a state of conflict, low intensity conflict that we don't see. But like the Cold War, it's not an act of conflict. It has different rules and to win it is gonna require a similar, act, uh, a similar determination of national will, but also coming up with new tactics and strategies that are appropriate to the technology. And when you go back to the antecedent of the nuclear war and you have someone, for instance, like Einstein or others, we've had people come from other countries who used to be adversaries, they come to the United States, and that's been where we've had some of our greatest innovations and development. So I worry about, uh, you need to balance on the one hand, it's great to have Chinese uh, here. Some of our best innovations in American companies are coming from Chinese immigrants. At the same time, you need to be winning that, they're being ex that they can be exploited and some may be spies and they might go back and provide that same technical expertise to China. What you're seeing now to try to address some of this is new regime. There's this Foreign Investment Review Modernization Act. It made certain changes in that group I was talking about, the Committee on Foreign Investment inside the United States. But it has also required the Commerce Department to come up with new export restrictions for so-called emerging technologies, which includes the transfer, the person-to-person -person transfer of some of those technologies. So just like you know, there might be um, a nuclear code that you're not permitted to train someone on or transmit. They're encouraged to look at new emerging technology like artificial intelligence, like quantum, to see whether that should be licensed and if so, how it should be restricted. So it's one way people are trying to address um, the, the issue that you've, that you've raised. And where to draw that balance, I think, is hard. Last question. So, so in the Cold War, we had a thing called mutually assured destruction. Um, in, do you see that as something in the future in the Cold War? It's not exactly, unfortunately. And so some were trying to apply that doctrine here. And the problem is we moved further and faster than anybody else. And so in some, in some arenas, I think it could be effective where our deterrent strategy is in the same sphere as the attack. In others, let's take North Korea's attack on Sony. You in this room probably have more IP addresses uh, than the entire country of North Korea. So if we knocked all of North Korea offline, it would not be a good deterrent against North Korean action. So we need to think through strategically when we're trying to come up with deterrence, where are we strong and they are weak? where we can attack. And that's why I think you've seen use of sanctions because our dollar is strong and people need to access our financial system. It's why we use the criminal justice system. If Russia brings a case, nobody believes it. It has no credibility. But the American justice system is still respected throughout the world for its in independence and ob objectivity. When we bring a case, other countries sign up and say that they believe that it occurred. And we saw that with the Chinese indictment of the, the PLA. It means now we need to make sure we keep those, uh, that we keep those systems and our va uh, values as strong as they are. And we need to keep being creative at coming up with other tools where we are strong and they're weak. One thing I think we've way underutilized in this battle that we did use in the Cold War is 
multilateral coalitions of like-minded countries to take simultaneous action. Uh, we saw a little bit of that when Russia unleashed the NotPetya. This was a, a ransom worm, self-propagating um, malware that locks up your computer so you can't get it back. It's usually used by criminal groups who demand a ransom. If you pay them, you're able to get your data back. NotPetya, there was no way to pay. It hit uh, Maersk shipping and caused $700 million worth of damage. It hit FedEx, caused $300 million worth of damage and other companies around the world, so billions of dollars. That was a great opportunity, I think, to send a multilateral, because all countries were mad, uh, and saying that this was ir irresponsible and really impose a greater consequence on, uh, on Russia. And I do think uh, you know, that's an area where I was disappointed when our, our commander in chief stood with President Putin at Helsinki and essentially sided with uh, Putin's uh, Russians over our intelligence community findings. Leading up to that, there had been a growing coalition building around uh, NotPetya, but with leadership, I think that that's an area where we could impose significant sanctions, expulsion of diplomats, other measures that cause real, real pain. Thank you again. Thank you. So we have, as we have our uh, uh, little after party. Please uh, enjoy, enjoy. We also have John is going to be outside. Uh, please uh, uh, have, his, have your book signed. Uh, he'll be signing out books. Uh, and of course, I have a little gift for him, which I'll give him later, the, the four pens. So we'll be giving that later. And again, thank you very much for show, uh, showing up, especially in this weather. Really appreciate it. <laughs>